Welcome back to Known Unknowns Watergate. I'm Hugh Hewitt, the president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. We come to you from the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. Behind me is a picture of the president's birthplace. We hope you visit the facility. On my right is Jeff Shepard, who is a member of the Nixon White House and a member of the Nixon defense team as we explore what Watergate is, was, and wasn't in the course of eight hours. This is episode number six. Jeff Shepard, we've talked about the tapes. We've talked about the installation of the taping system, past presidents having tapes. We've talked about your role in transcribing the tapes, guarding the tapes during the defense of the president. What was the president's connection with the tapes? Well, it was quite remote, Hugh. Uh, uh, the, the, the tape system was installed in February of 1971. And it's automatic. So if the president's in the room and there's sound, it's, it's recorded. And of course, if it's a tap on a phone line, it's very clear. If it's in the Oval Office, it's pretty clear. If it's in the uh, hideaway office in the old executive office building, it's, it's terrible. It's unintelligible. Uh, uh, you get snippets. Uh, and it's, it's unique when you're working on those transcripts and you're working on the snippets, snippets you hear what you want to hear. Uh, you, you, listen to the same thing 10 times and it, it keeps changing on you. So uh, never once were those tapes ever played uh, uh, until uh, Alex Butterfield revealed their existence. Nixon didn't want them for current use. They were supposed to be his research library for after he left the presidency. Nobody was supposed to know. He was going to reference them if he needed them and then destroy them. It was never supposed to be known that they that it existed at all but you know it came out and and and, and uh, there was a subpoena that first week from the special prosecutor and they asked for nine tapes at the beginning mainly connected with John Dean. We've not yet introduced the concept of the special prosecutor so I'm looking more at this point for what the president did with the tapes regardless of who's asking for them or not. When did he start to listen to them? Well, the first thing he did was ask Rose with, with, uh, with Fred Bizart's Rose Woods. Rose Woods, his longtime personal secretary. She was set up, uh, and, and her assistant, a fine lady named Marge Acker, uh, and they set about doing transcripts. And, and this is very, very hard because uh, the tapes aren't all that high quality. They're on six-inch individual reels, so your first task is to find the conversation. Actually, uh, the first task is to find the tapes. Where were they physically stored after they ran out of reel? Uh, the Secret Service saw to that. There was a uh, cabinet. I think it was built in under a staircase where the tapes were all set. And they but, marked them with the date. Oh, no, absolutely. And time. Uh, but for example, these are individual recorders. So if it was a telephone line. All the telephone taps are on that tape. It may not run out for a long time. Uh, if it was uh -huh. an Oval Office, it might be replaced once or twice a day. Uh, but if he walks from the Oval Office to the old EOB, the tape recorders don't follow him. Those are on different reels. And so you've got the president's daily diary. There's, it's amazing what they do. with it. You, you, you can go online and find these. Uh, the president uh, uh, came to the Oval Office at... at at 7.03 a.m. At 7.15, he was given breakfast that consisted of. At 7.22, Bob Haldeman came in and stayed for eight minutes. At C, he took a phone call. And they just document minute by minute what the president did during the course of the day. So Rose so, is dispatched to assemble into one coherent transcript everything that has happened on the tapes? No, 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 not at all. Uh, uh, the subpoena was nine tapes. She is, she is told to transcribe the subpoenaed conversations, nothing more, nothing less. She has to figure out who's in the meeting, who's talking, when they're talking. And as we found from this very system here today, we talk over each other. Uh, you gesture, you say and so on. You don't speak in clipped sentences like you would in a stage play to convey accurately to the audience. You say you know. And somebody else in search of thought halfway through. You're joking. Oh, no, not at all. I did that purposely. These are, these are very, very hard to do. Yes. And, and I, there's I know that. I said that for the benefit of the listeners okay. so that they would understand and think about, God, I don't hope I never have to transcribe anything. You, it's an interesting thing. You try taping your Thanksgiving dinner, and then you try preparing a transcript. And you can't do it. 
You don't know if it was Bobby or John. You don't know if that clank was the spoon or the platter. I mean, you just, you, you, it's very, very hard. Right, you got it. Uh, and there's a huge difference between reading a transcript and hearing the tape. There's an emphasis on the words. There's a... There's an elevation sometimes. Uh, there's strong feelings. There's hesitancy. There's also profanity or there is. expletives deleted. I am the expletive deleter. Uh, uh, that was one of my one of my jobs. Why did you a, a diversion? Why did you do that? Uh, to preserve the dignity of the office. It was that out, your choice? Was it oh, Fred's no, choice? Nothing, was it president's never choice? Never my choice. Never your yeah. choice. Uh, I'm just a, an underling. Uh, the president did not swear with the consistency and frequency that the tapes imply. Uh, you would think he would be perhaps like Lyndon Johnson, you know, with these exquisite... Uh, A profanity earthy, volcano. Earthy descriptions, nothing like that. The trouble was, Nixon used the adjective goddamn all the time. And, and he, I think, didn't even realize he was saying it, but if he felt strongly he would say, don't hit the table with that goddamn mug. You know, and, and it just kept coming up. Then we're going to publish the transcript. And the president says, uh-oh, this is using the Lord's name in vain. Let's remove it. So Fred Bazark comes up with a phrase, expletive deleted in, in uh, brackets. brackets. And I said, listen, I'm happy to do that, of course. You're deleting an adjective, and when you delete it, people will think it's a different word. They will think it's the F word. And you, you, you really shouldn't do this. Why don't we, we eliminate the word God, leave the word damn, so they'll know you weren't saying the F word? Goes back up the chain. I never spoke to the president. I spoke to Fred, Fred spoke to the president. Answer comes back down, no. Do it the way we instruct it. And I called it the Baptist filter because I think the president felt that using the Lord's name in vain would offend his core supporters. And it was better they thought he was using the F word than to know for sure what he did. Speculation, but what was his, the nine tapes are subpoenaed, they're transcribed yes. after yes. Rosewood's painstakingly put them together. What does the president do with those transcripts? When does he actually physically come into contact with the tapes? I don't know. Uh, they have records, it can be found, that at some point he says, I guess I better listen to the tape. But I don't think that it had to do with those first nine. It may have. Uh, the difficulties got compounded because two of the nine conversations were never recorded in the first place. There was a phone call, and that phone wasn't tapped. There was a tape, and it, he returned to the office, to the hideaway office late in the day, and the tape machine, which had a backup reel, ran out of the backup reel, so that conversation of April 15th was never recorded. What? is the missing minutes. How many right. of them are there and from what tape and how do you imagine, Jeff Shepard, that those minutes went missing? Let me postpone that just for a second. Oh, Jeff, you will answer no. a question directly <coughs> I someday. will, just a moment. He must have listened to those tapes because he knew those two conversations hadn't been recorded and he didn't get around to telling his lawyers. Okay? So they held that against him so when they said we're going to turn over all nine tapes, they then learned two of them hadn't been recorded, and there's the 18-minute gap. Now let's go back to the 18-minute gap. Okay. Do, when did that gap occur, and what is Jeff Shepard's best view as to how it occurred? Uh, the gap is in a conversation dated June 20th, 1972, which is three days after the break-in arrests, and three days before the smoking gun tape. It is the first time the president meets with Bob Haldeman in front of a taping machine because they were both out of town uh, when the break-in arrests occurred. And Nixon is down in the Bahamas. Uh, uh, Haldeman is out in California, and they come back to work, and there's a meeting. 
and Haldeman's notes say the word Watergate. But when we go to produce the tape, uh, there is an 18-minute gap on the tape. This is what Fred told me. Others have said, I I've heard other stories, Jeff. I'm not sure that is true, but it's only what Fred told me at the time. We decided we would make copies of the tapes because when we learned the two conversations didn't exist, Sirica said, I think rightly, I want the whole reel. I don't want just that segment because there's been hanky pink and, and therefore I want the reel. So Fred, being, having been the general counsel of the Department of Defense, knew people at the National Security, uh, Security Agency, NSA. NSA are the talk people, okay? So his colleague at NSA and Fred went over at night to NSA and made high-speed copies of the seven reels. Now, they got to find the conversation. And what Fred had done, had this little list in his coat pocket that was the footage of each conversation. So we know, as an example, it's on tape number 17. And Fred would say, what I want you to do is transcribe this tape. Uh, it's at 122 feet into the reel. So you'd get that close, and then you have to fish around trying to find the conversation. Later, he put a little slip of paper in the reel so you could see right where it was. You could get right to it. But that wasn't done when he went over to NSA, so they're trying to find these conversations. And his colleague, wh whose name I never learned, uh, says, uh, I keep running into this missing segment, and there's this buzz. And it turned out there was this 18 minute, 18 and a half minute gap. There's a buzz for the first three minutes or so, and then it changes tone, but it's throughout. Fred comes back, and he knows that Rose has been working on the transcripts. So he believes Rose has caused the gap. Now we learn that Rose really did cause the first five or, uh, three or five minutes, that she's transcribing, as she describes, the phone rings, she reaches for the phone, and she inadvertently hit or somehow had the erase button on. Now she's switching back and forth, manually, forward, backward, forward, backward, trying to go over the words. You can't, you can't get but three or four words, you gotta turn it off, go back, start again. It's very time consuming, very tedious. Uh, uh, but she maintains it certainly wasn't 18 minutes. Fred suspects Rose anyway. She was the only one handling the tapes at this point. She so goes over to the special prosecutor to Leon Jaworski and he says, we have a problem. There's this gap on one of the subpoenaed conversations. And if you work with us, we can figure out who did it. But we're on your side on this thing. We're not fooling around. We're straight lawyers. And Jaworski says, well, that may well be, but we have to inform John Sirica right now. So the two of them go over to see Judge Sirica, explain the situation, and Sirica says, I want a hearing this afternoon. This has to become public right now. And Bazart says, that will end any hope of an investigation. Sirica says, I'm scheduling a hearing for 2 o'clock. And the only person who knows about the gap is Fred Bazart. So the president's lawyer is placed on the stand while prosecutors who had no involvement in uncovering the gap get to cross-examine him as though they've discovered the gap. And Fred is demeaned and made to believe that somehow he's involved. He was really upset when he got back from that. But, and then, of course, Rose says, I, you know, except for these three minutes, I had nothing to do with it. So Fred decides, we'll get this tape expert who was making me copies to come over and see if it's the machine, the, the recorder that caused the gap. And this takes a long time, but as it turns out, this is a Ewer 5000 tape recorder and it, and it has a faulty bridge rectifier, 
and if it's plugged into the same outlet, you've got a double outlet there, okay, two outlets, and the other outlet has a tensor lamp. Do you remember the tensor sure. lamps? Your viewers may not know, or your listeners, but it's a single stock and a very, very bright light called a, a tensor lamp, and it consumed massive amounts of amperage. And there was a problem in that outlet, so that if the tensor light were on and that particular recorder were plugged in to the same outlet, there would be a buzz. Now, whether the buzz caused the erasure or not, we don't know. But Fred Bizarre and this NSA guy go over to Rose Wood's office at night after she's gone home, and he recreates the buzz. So Fred calls me uh, on Thanksgiving Day and says, your job when you come to work tomorrow, we're not taking Friday off after Thanksgiving, uh, is to find a tape expert, outsider, who can testify as to this situation because the, the NSA guy can't do it. He can't come into court. So your job is go find a tape expert that, that we can qualify and come in and explain this gap because we've, we've solved it. So I uh, uh, talk to a local hi-fi shop and say, you know, who knows and all this stuff. And they say Westinghouse is the tape experts. So we call Westinghouse Corporation. I think they're in Pittsburgh. We want your best tape guy. And the general counsel comes on. This is the White House, you know. You, and he says, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure we want to play. And, and he said, now, we're a big defense contractor, and we understand. He says, can't be near the tapes. I said, no, we're working with copies. This is no problem at all. They produce a tape expert, comes over and comes in on Saturday. I, Rose isn't there. I take him over to Rose's office, and I say, here, go make it make it buzz. We don't know about the tensor light at this time. We don't know about the special outlet. He, he can't make it buzz. So he's going to take the directions home to the hotel, think about it, come back the next day. Now, the little office where they were working on transcribing the tape is not the office where Rose Woods is on the cover of Newsweek magazine. With, Reaching back. With a Rose Mercy. Right. That's that's her ceremonial office. Uh, uh, the little office where they had to have absolute silence. They had to, you know, nobody around to do these transcripts. Is a tiny little closet, close, but tiny. So tiny, two people couldn't be in the office at the same time. So when I took this tape expert over on Saturday with my White House pass, I never enter the office. He does. He sits down. He fools with a recorder. He can't take the recorder because Rose is going to come back to, to work. So he takes the directions for the recorder. He comes back the next day. I'm doing other stuff. Another lawyer took him over. He still can't produce the buzz. But then it turned out, to our surprise, the special prosecutors concluded the tape recorder itself was evidence. And they wanted to know who touched the evidence. So that poor Westinghouse tape expert dragged in from the grand jury, his name becomes public, Westinghouse is all upset, and I skate free because I never entered the office, although the FBI did come to talk to me. Did President Nixon ever touch the tape recorder? Not to the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, and, and I don't think anybody's ever suggested that he did, although he did at one point have the tape recorder set up so he could listen to the tape. Now, whether he did the controls or not, I'm unable to tell you. Does anybody know that answer? Yeah, probably Steve Bull. Steve Bull was his uh, personal assistant, and he would have set up the recorder. Uh, to so, listen to that specific well, tape? Well, uh, listen to tapes. To listen because to the tapes. implication in the audience and in the public mind is that Nixon erased the 18 and a half minutes. I find it highly unlikely. Yeah, I don't think it's ever seriously been alleged that Nixon himself did that erasure. Uh, it, it, it's been suggested that Rose did it on his behalf. It's been suggested, if, if you really carefully examine the tape, there's a, a nine separate starts and stops 
where somebody was alleg allegedly erasing, be sure they got everything. Uh, the the uh, th they say there was one guy who alleged that Holloman's notes are are uh, redone, that there was a page missing. Uh, but you know, when you're in there talking to the president, particularly Bob Holloman, uh, who's in there all the time. The only thing you're taking notes on is what the president tells you to do, not what you tell the president. I mean, if I'm briefing you, I don't need to note what, I, what I'm saying. So the fact it said Watergate doesn't mean he was telling the president. Well, now, now that we know the president's relationship with them, I want to go back to the Watergate special committee and the fact that after those five days occurred, John Dean has gone to the prosecutors has struck a deal with the Senate Select Committee. Yes. And now the hearings are getting underway. What is the president doing? What is Ehrlichman and Haldeman doing when these hearings gear up? After, and when did they know that John Dean's gone the other way? Uh, it occurs over the month of April, 1973. Uh, uh, John Dean retains his lawyer on March 28th, the lawyer has his first meeting, I, I believe, on April 2nd, and then it's kind of, you know, they, they meet at the lawyer's office in Rockville, Maryland, a deep suburb of uh, Washington, D.C., sometimes for four or five hours. Does Dean resign his position as White House counsel? No. Does he tell anyone that he's retained counsel? Uh, yes. The implication is he's retained <clears throat> criminal defense counsel to get a briefing on the finer points of criminal law in his work as counsel to the president. He doesn't say, I'm, I'll be leaving you. And then uh, uh, at, at one point, uh, uh, he comes in and he takes all of his files, and that's it. They, they, I get a call from the Oval Office saying, uh, uh, we don't know where John Dean is. Uh, do you happen to know on a Monday morning? And I say, no, I'm not that close to him. Uh, uh, and they said, well, he cleared a vehicle uh, in, in through the gate, and the guy driving the vehicle was named Shepard, and you're the only Shepard we know. And I'm saying, N not me. <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and in the, in, the, in the notes, he talks with the president, the, in the uh, tape recordings, he talks with the president about leaving, and they, and they work out a letter of resignation. But then it's not uh, official, officially named until April 30th, uh, 1973, uh, when the president announces the departure of Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Dick Kleindienst, who's attorney general, and John Dean. And John Dean is noted as, as having been terminated, the others as having res uh, resigned. Why did Dean tell the president he was leaving? Was he being fired, or was he leaving out of his own volition? It was, uh, uh, he was not being fired at the time. He, it was getting too complicated, and he felt he should absent himself. There is, in my memory, and again, I am your audience, someone who knows a little bit about this, a safe in Howard Hunt's office, the contents of which mysteriously disappear. Yes. When did the disappearance occur? What do you suspect, though you cannot know, was in there? Oh, I can know. I know precisely what was in there. Uh, uh, the break-in occurs on June 17th. Uh, the quick news within two or three days is the Cubans have a uh, address book with uh, Howard Hunt's phone number at the White House. In the book, Hunt has been a consultant to Chuck Colson. He's been working on the plumber stuff. He has an office on the uh, fourth floor. There's a safe in the office. We better figure out what's in the safe. They call GSA, who you know maintains the physical building, and they drill the safe, and they bring the contents to John Dean's office, and John Dean sits on the floor with his assistant Fred Fielding, and they sort out what's there, and they decide this has all got to be turned over to the FBI. And there's three categories of stuff. Uh, there's the general stuff that he has in the safe, included a, a, a pistol and some other, other things. Uh, there's some draft cables, uh, which turn out to be an effort to draft a cable that the Kennedy administration might have sent 
to Vietnam agreeing to the assassination of President Diem. The that US contemporaneous ally. with the actual assassination, or was it made up later to be a dirty trick to pin Diem on the Kennedys? Both. Uh, it could be both. It can't be well, both. Well, supposedly it, it was sent in anticipation of his assassination. <clears throat> it is being drafted or invented by Howard Hunt. Now, let's pause on that because I don't want to get into that too deeply right now. The third thing, a part of the Hunt material, is uh, uh, Hunt's uh, Hermes notebooks, which, which are high-end French uh, uh, leather notebooks, uh, and an, a pop-up address book. And those two items, John Dean separates out and puts in his file cabinet. The normal stuff is boxed up, and, and it's going to be presented to the FBI in John Ehrlichman's office, I believe. And there are these, this, this uh, draft, this draft, drafts of a cable. And they say to Pat Gray, this material, this is yours. This material in this envelope has nothing to do with Watergate. We'll tell you that. But it's very embarrassing. And it should never see the light of day. We want to be able to certify that we turned over the contents of Hunt Safe to the FBI. So we're giving this to you and we're telling you it has nothing to do with Watergate and we don't want it to become public. It later turns out that Pat Gray interprets that as an instruction to destroy it. And when he's at his vacation home, I think over Christmas time, but whenever, he burns it in his vacation home's fireplace. He says without ever really studying it, it looked like a cable, okay? Causes quite a, uh, a rigmarole when it comes out. So the FBI has most of the contents. Pat Gray gets something which he later destroys. John keeps out two or three significant items. Howard Hunt, back to Howard Hunt. He's been, he's pledged to six counts. He's, he's been convicted. He's been sent away to prison and they're hauling him back in front of a grand jury. They've given him immunity from further prosecution, so he can't take the Fifth Amendment. And they're saying, we want to know everything you know about what happened. And he says, everything I know was in these notebooks. I know they were in my safe, because after the break-in arrests, I took them and I put them there. I thought it was the safest place in the city of Washington. It was guarded. It was uh, in White House hands. Uh, and those will show that everything I did uh, I did under the direction and control of John Dean. When does Hunt say this and to whom does he tell it? Well, he has to say it after March 23rd, which is when he's led away in chains uh, at some point. Uh, and the special prosecutors occasionally ask John, what about this? And then there's this memo. John Dean formalizes his plea bargain to one count, and it's announced in court, they knew John was participating with the prosecutors, but it's formally announced in court on the morning of October 19th, the Friday morning, uh, uh, and he pleads guilty to a single count. And that's worked out between his lawyer, Charles Schaffer, and the head of the Watergate task force, a gentleman by the name of James Neal. Now that's important because Schaffer and Neal were the prosecution team uh, personally recruited by Robert Kennedy to the Get Hoffa squad at the Department of Justice who secured the first conviction of James Hoffa uh, for, for jury tampering in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They are long and dear colleagues. If you're going to be investigated by the Department of Justice, it's best to have a lawyer who's a former colleague and close friend of the lead, lead uh, uh, prosecutor. So, so they, they do, they, 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 they enter his plea, perfectly clear to the White House, John Dean's getting off with a slap on the, uh, on the wrist, and everybody else is, is going to be charged with all these crimes for the cover-up. And then, that's October 19th. On November 5th, one of the prosecutors, uh, I, I, I think it's George Frampton, but I'm not possible, positive, uh, is with John Dean. And he says, well, what about these notebooks? Hunt keeps swearing they were in the safe. And Dean goes, oh, those notebooks. 
You know, it's a funny thing. I had separated them out. I put them in my uh, file cabinet. I came across them months later, and, and uh, they didn't seem significant, so I shredded them. And so the guy writes a memo to the file, as he should, on November 5th, 1973. John Dean, for the first time, told us he had destroyed these items. And then they actually announced that the next day in court. Per I mean, perfectly straight. But yes, John Dean destroyed evidence, evidence that Howard Hunt claimed was absolutely critical, and the special prosecutors who've based their entire prosecution on the word and testimony of John Dean charge him with nothing. All right, I want to go back. Now that that is cleared up, I want to get back to the timeline very quickly to set up part seven. The Senate special hearing gets underway. When does Archibald Cox enter the picture vis-a-vis -vis these hearings? When is the special prosecutor oh, appointed? We have to go back to April 30th. Uh, 1973. Yeah, yeah when Ehrlichman, Haldeman, Kleindienst, and the dean leave the scene and are, 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 are removed. That's the big change. That's when everything uh, 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 gets very, very serious and we get uh, a, a special prosecutor with a specially recruited, highly partisan team of a hundred people to investigate Richard Nixon. We will talk about that in episode seven.